Uh, 701, we'll call the meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. Great, great to see every, everyone back. Hope that everyone was able to have an enjoyable, an enjoyable break for the last few months. Mark, of course, had a much longer break than the rest of us. Attorney Bobrowski, you got to get caught up on a lot of things. So, I not necessarily the reason. I'm going to have, they... a, gonna have a first draft here by December 10th. So, so. That, that is a good thing. Yep. I just have to glue it all together. So, for today's meeting, as you may have seen from the agenda that was posted, we're going to start with some of the uh, some of the various bylaws that we that Attorney Bobrowski has come up with. First, we have to go over the minutes that were that were taken. Much appreciation for them from the last meeting, Joe. Really appreciate that. If we can have a motion to approve the minutes as presented, so moved. So, Anne, Tim, if you want to make sure you get the recording, Anne has made the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Excellent. And minute, minute, the motion has been made and seconded by Lucy. Thank you very much. And it looks like Catherine is joining us as well. Welcome, Catherine. Okay, so we've got a motion on the floor to approve the, the minutes. Motion has been made by Anne, seconded by Lucy, as presented. Minutes show that the members were, were present, and the the one vote that was taken was noted as to um, actually the, the various the various uh, minutes were show that roll call was taken for each of the approvals of the minutes and the adjournment. Otherwise, it has discussion of the various topics that were made. Any discussion on the minutes themselves? Okay, with that, we've got a motion to approve the minutes. I will call on each person in the order in which your name appears on the screen. So with that, Eric? Yes. Tim? I'll just vote present. Ann? That's yes. yes. Joe? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Lucy? Oh. Yes. Catherine? I'll also vote present since I wasn't at the meeting. OK. And I will vote in the affirmative. With that, we have, we have five, five ayes, no nays, two present. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. I'll go ahead and mark them as approved and send, the, send a copy off to town clerk and to the administrative assistant to the town administrator, who will then post them to the website as appropriate. Thank you very much. That takes care of of the minutes. So we do have a couple of people from the public here. I believe that would be uh, Councillor Vincent and Mr. M Attorney McGrail. If you'd like to contribute to the public engagement portion of the meeting, you are obviously welcome to do so. If you'd rather just give your give comments that you may have during the meeting, that's also encouraged. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait till the meeting. Okay. With that, we're going to continue with the review of the bylaws themselves. I will bring them up on screen consistent with how we have done other meetings in the past. A copy of these were, was actually posted as well to the website so that people, if they wanted to view the drafts, they could. Okay, is everyone able to see the the actual draft itself? 
Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. So with that, Attorney Bobrowski, first one we have is 333 scientific accessory uses. We've got four on, on the agenda for tonight, just so we didn't overload people with too much reading material. So it's 333, 34, 81, and 82, just to give you a heads up as to which ones for tonight itself. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everybody. Been a while. Um, what I've done in the interim is go through the, the way, the way I recodify a bylaw is I take your old bylaw and I chop it up. So I've got old scientific, old accessory uses, old accessory uses, old affordability, old conversions, old creative overlay district, old design review. I take those pieces individually and I massage them, edit them out, just a little bit of uh, uh, really just uh, nothing substantive, just fixing grammar, things of that sort. Um, and then I, I'm guessing at where this is going to end up. It'll certainly end up under accessory uses, which right now looks to be about section 3.3, but I'm, it'll probably be renumbered further. This is a, a, pro, a provision that comes directly from the statute. So uh, there's really not much massaging to do here. Um, it's a mad scientist statute, if you will. If you want to do scientific work out of your home, the legislature long ago said, go, go for it upon the issuance of a special permit. And you're not um, going to let the mad scientist cause any harm to public health or safety. So th this is just something that I uh, pieced out individually. There's really nothing uh, special about it. I think I've only run into it about, well, really about two or three times. There was a gentleman down in Kingston, Massachusetts, who was um, actually he was making a glue out of um, out of out of bivalves for um, believe it or not, and um, he became famous when his house, um, which was under renovation, collapsed, and before he could get home, the building commissioner bulldozed it. And he won in court something on the order of four million dollars. He was a legit scientist, and he lost everything in the uh, in the uh, in the disaster that followed. But that so that it's pretty rare. So that's about all I have to say about this. I didn't make it up. It's in the statute, and it's in your current bylaw too. A lot of what I've done in terms of the pieces that we're gonna look at tonight is I, if I had a question, I put a comment in the right margin. If again, if, if I was uh, making changes uh, that were substantive, I made them in yellow so that you could see them and call them out. Um, I'm looking at my list of things that I sent you for today. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 things. And many of them are as short as this. For example, if Dan were to pull up trailer next, it's it's basically the same length. And then yet to go in what are basically non-residential uh, bylaws that I've looked at. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and there's two signed provisions, so twelve. So thirteen and twelve is twenty-five separate sections that I've gone through, with the exception of signs. They're not quite done yet. Um, and I'm, I'm going to send Dan a load of these uh, tomorrow because they're ready to go. So if there's no questions or any discussion here on scientific accessory uses, Dan, I'll let you just call up the next one. Yeah, Dan, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, I was on, was on mute. And... I, I think there, there we may have a sign of the times uh, you know this one may may go um, without too much discussion but yes there there as you noted there are multiple sign bylaws I'm trying not to overload the committee with everything all at once because that would be just in terms of expectations a little bit overwhelming so that's why we're we're chunking it for these meetings as well having it, it they're in the area where if the committee wants to look at additional pieces they can but I'm gonna just post it, post things publicly as they're ready for meeting discussion. Uh, Mr. McRail. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just curious how this fits in, Mark, with we've got 
it's referenced, this type of use is referenced in our table of uses. Yes. And, and I don't know if it's something, if you're looking at this, something is something different than that. Um, because in our table of uses, we've got something that's categorized as research or testing laboratory. Providing that's, it a as principle, a that's a principal use. Okay. This is an accessory use basically out of the home. Let me just go back. Hang on a second. Is that why you're going to recategorize it? Because it's in an awkward place. Yeah, no, I'm just going to put it with the other accessory uses, which I just uh, did today. Uh, the accessory uses that I saw were nicely divided up into residential, agricultural, business, industrial districts. Each had its own little section. And then there were a couple of standout, uh, standalone things. One was accessory apartments and the other one was um, arts, arts and crafts, I think. And so I've recodified those as well. Home occupations would go in this category and accessory scientific uses would go in this category too. Now the rule on accessory uses has changed somewhat in the last five years. We can thank Judge Foster for this. Um, I had a case in Charlton. The, uh, I was representing the planning board. The proponents were seeking approval of a uh, 1 million square foot grow facility, about 800,000 of it was grow, about 200,000 of it was manufacturing and processing of cannabis products. Uh, I argued that there was no mention in the use table of accessory manufacturing and processing with regard to um, cannabis. And if that was the case in the principal use section of the use table, I would have won because use is not expressly permitted or prohibited and your use table follows the same format. But Judge Foster said, well, that's that's good for principal uses, but for accessory uses, you can't possibly envision all accessory uses. So I'm gonna say that the ones that are listed are certainly allowed and others that meet the test for an accessory use are as well which means that they're um, incidental and subordinate and customarily associated with. So what, what section of this bot, where is 3.3.3? No, that's just a number that I put there. So what, I'm what, gonna, section, what section of our current bylaw is this out of? I don't know, I'd have to look at the current bylaw. I think it's under, it's under special permits and site plan review 19047, which is not an accessory use. That's well, that's, this, this is the way that the statute verbatim of refers to this use and it's in chapter 48 section 9 yeah and i'm just saying it's not an accessory use in our bylaw it's a principal use that's that's why it's under 190 47 uh let me, scientific let me, research let me, i'm going to disappear and grab your bylaw hang on While Mark is doing that, um, can I just ask, is there is the question of us whether we, like, what is the question related to this specific bylaw or, yeah, this specific bylaw and then the other ones we know will come as well? Is it just where it's being put and how it's being codified or whether we want to change it or something well, else? My my question is, I, I think this is applicable. This is a this is a pretty important section of our bylaw because if we're trying to attract scientific uh, research and development and laboratory in Edgewater Park and places like that, that's where this comes in. And, it, has no, it has nothing to do with that. It's uh, an I, accessory of uh, scientific use, meaning it's not principal. You're trying to attract full scale businesses. That's a principal use. I, I don't see it in the bylaw. 
I mean, it, our, our bylaws at Title 19047, Scientific Research and Development, and that's this bylaw. Well, hang on a second. It's not listed as an accessory use. That's my issue with it. So hopefully this helps. I just brought it up on screen. There you go. Yeah, that's 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 the statute that we're looking at. And so uh, the, I'm going to try and address both Lucy's question and Attorney McGrail's question. The our our goal and our job is to look at the bylaws and make the figure out what we think is in the best interest of the town that that's our our mandate from and our, our marching orders from the charter itself and so we can make any changes the, and propose any changes to the bylaws themselves obviously anything we do will go before town meeting but we can propose changes if we want to remove, propose that sections get removed, we can do that, including in as the recodifications of where things go, we can it, we, we can change that as well. So that addresses that piece. And I think the, what Attorney McGrail, what you're, the issue that I think you're raising is whether this should be listed as an accessory use it, or whether it should just be a primary use. And that may be resolved by, by possibly moving where it is in the in the recodification and getting more of the word accessory. Well, this comes from the statute, so I wouldn't go rewording the statute. It would just be the title potentially. Yeah, that's. But if you read it carefully, it says uses whether or not on the same parcels as activities permitted as of right, accessory to activities permitted as a matter of right. So if you take out that intervening clause, it's use as accessory to activities permitted as of right, which activities are scientific, are allowed by special permit. That's somewhere the legislature long ago, this has been in the books for, uh, it's been on the books for at least, I don't think, it, I think it was in the 1976 recodification of the statute. So it goes way back and it's just an encouragement on the part of the legislature to you know, work remotely, I guess, how prescient of them before the pandemic. So is the problem that we titled this wrong in our bylaw? I don't think there's a problem because... with it at all. I think you just have to put it with the other accessory uses because it's clearly something that regulates an accessory activity. Well, like right. I said, in that in that respect, it's like accessory apartment, home occupation. Think of it as a home occupation with science. No, right. Um, my question is the scientific research and development, as it's titled under 19047. Yeah. That, Brian, you seem to be implying that that's for something that's not an accessory use. But the language of the statute, I mean, our code, which um, reflects the statute, makes it clear that it's accessory, what, you know, Bob's saying. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm reading it like a lawyer. I'm trying to say, if it's truly an accessory use, did scientific research and development, who came up with that title? Is that statutory as well? Uh, it's in the in the statute. It's just a okay. section nine of chapter 40A has 13, 14, 15 paragraphs. They just keep yeah. adding to them. They're not captioned. They're just one okay. after the other. So what I'm taking from this is that the discussion really isn't around the language, which isn't changing here. It's just around the titling, which may have been an editor's, an editorial decision done by the editors when eCode was put together. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's all it's oddly written. I mean, you know, I'm wondering, you know, so so in Mark, I'm asking you the question because I don't know the answer to this. So how do you think that fits in? When you go to our table of uses, mm -hmm. you put it um, under you put it under accessories. The accessories. Yeah, but I want to show you something that's there. Maybe this shouldn't be there. Just to footnote this. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, can I share my screen for a second? Thank you.
Oh, I can't share. It won't let yeah. me. Now, now you can. Thank you. I made you a co-host. See, it, it, this is a good place to yeah. uh, scroll back. If you see, right here, Mark. Yeah, the, so these are intermingled with principal uses, and what I would, what I have proposed in the new use table that I've already shared with you, is that the back section of the use table is accessory uses, and this would be listed along with home occupations, accessory apartments. Um, I think there's something about accessory arts and crafts endeavors. Uh, there's swimming pools. There's uh, just remembering them off the top of my head from what I saw today. Um, and those would all be in the last section of the use table together. If you go, if you scroll back up, Dan, yep. you can see in the... Keep going, Mark. You want to stop right there, stop right there. So you've got some things here that are accessory too. I saw them as you were coming through this. Right here? Yeah, accessory uses in the business zone. Yeah. That would be an excess. So that would move to the back, right? I mean, I just I just think it needs to be thought out how this works with 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 this because because you know you have what we have is we have research and testing laboratory. That's that, a principal use. Mm -mm. I mean, so but but it's not it's not a, so we, I can have it in my house, but I can't have it alone. That's what you're saying. No, that's a that's a full scale eighty five thousand square foot R and D facility. It, but that but this isn't a defined use in our bylaw. That's the well, point. then we'll fix that problem. That's where it needs to be fixed because yeah. that's been interpreted to be one ninety forty seven. Okay, no, that they're nothing in common. That's this is, that's the point. This is yeah. R and D. What you've got there is R and D. So that so perhaps. What should happen is we should add an R and D definition. I think I probably let me just look at my maybe maybe you've done that. Let me look at my use table here. I gotta check it out. But I, I did go through it with an eye toward what you didn't have. It's just been so long. Um, let's see what I got here. Uh, yep, there it is. Research and Development Laboratory. Laboratory or research establishments, including biotechnology companies, but excluding laboratories categorized as level three and level four by the National Institutes for Health. That's in the new definition section. Right. Yeah, because we haven't had that definition, and that's a whole, you know, you've got uses to have uses allowed in your table of uses that you, you don't even know what they are. That's a problem. Yeah. No, I went through the uh, I went through the um, definitions that when I did the use table and anything that I saw that wasn't defined that I could easily grab a definition for, including that one I did. So. Thank you, Mark. I'm fine, Mr. Chia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any any other comments? Okay, there you are again. Perfect. On section, what's currently number 333 for scientific accessory uses. Just, just placeholder numbers. Don't, I don't, I, I'm just figuring out how I'm going to put the whole thing back together. But I, I just, I know that this is in section three. So that's all. Councilor Vincent, you're the only attorney that I'm aware of that hasn't opined on this section. Would you like to give an opinion just so we can at least have all the attorneys? Yeah, I, I certainly defer her to Mr. Yeah, no, I don't have anything to add. Okay. I'm not a I'm not a master's license attorney anyway. Okay, Move, moving along. Okay, is this our next one? This is our next one, 3.4, home occupations. 
This is one that, well, has gotten a lot of usage over the last few years. Well, you can see I already have a comment. Can you just scroll down to the bottom? I want to see what else I included on this stand. Oh, good. I, all right. So let me talk about yours, and then I'll talk about my suggestion. So you allow these as of right, and or maybe allowed by special permit. I'm sorry. You allow these by special permit. What does quiet and non-commercial in nature mean? Um, and you allow some of these by right, including things nobody really does anymore like dressmaking, you know, professionals, doctors, dentists, architects, and attorneys, CPAs, and others by special permit. There's not really a bright dividing line there. This is one of the most difficult things to define in a zoning bylaw because it keeps evolving. So in the first generation of home occupations, we had doctors, dentists, attorneys, architects, and CPAs. They were the favored occupations. And then realtors and psychologists and others complained that they were basically doing the same thing, engineers. So why couldn't they work out of their home too? And then it spread to things like hair uh, uh, professionals, including uh, salons, uh, barbers, um, and other people uh, that were more, uh, you know, that were comfortable working out of their house, provided that they had the right uh, wastewater treatment, for example, in the case of a beautician. So that's when you say that other home occupations may be allowed by special permit. You know, I, it, the dividing line for me wouldn't be quiet and non commercial. The dividing line for me would be whether or not the home occupation is going to change the way the neighborhood currently relates to each other. So if, if I've got a home occupation, and the only employees are people who live in the home with me. And I don't have any customers or clients or pupils coming to the property. For me, that pretty much says it's not going to change the nature of the neighborhood. And I would allow that by right. And I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from long experience that began really in Chelmsford many years ago. And this is the way that they had done this back in the 90s. And I thought it was a good approach especially in a larger town like you, where it's already past the point where people are bumping into each other. Well, some small towns, this wouldn't matter. And the other type of home occupation is a, a home occupation that does have non-residential employees. Let's just hypothetically say up to three. And there are clients or there are clients, pupils, customers coming to the house. And that one is gonna involve more traffic, greater need for parking. My friend John Mullen, who taught at UMass Amherst, once explained it to me as changing the social fabric of the neighborhood. If it's a small home occupation with no visitors, the kids are still playing at the end of the cul-de-sac, you know, driving those yellow plastic cars around and playing basketball. Once I start bringing customers, pupils, employees to the street, the kids aren't in the cul-de-sac anymore. They're behind the kitchen window where they can be kept an eye on. And that's a special permit. You want to make sure that that's under control. So that's the example that I've given you following what you're looking at on the screen. If you scroll down a little bit. Keep going. And that's, that's this alternative. So as of right, um, it's it's solely by the persons occupying the dwelling. Number two, it's clearly incidental and secondary. Three, no offensive noise, smoke, anything bad. No sales. Uh, does not utilize exterior storage, and does not produce any uh, customer or client trips to the location, and has no non-resident employees. That would be as of right. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor or you're making something for the internet. Um, which is, you know, probably where a lot of this is headed. And then the other one by special permit, you comply with the basics. Um, it's conducted within a dwelling, no more than two non-resident. That's just a number, could be three. Does not exhibit any in exterior indication. And uh, what's, is there one more down there? Yeah, special permit. 
And you've, you've got a 25% limit, I think back in yours, but there's case law from fairly recent vintage of a house in Hadley, Massachusetts, where they were running a home business and it got really too big for its bridges. And eventually it was swallowing 51% of the space in the home. And the court said, shut it down and go find a place downtown. So I think anything under 50% is probably legal. 25% uh, seems, you know, that's an okay number. I'm just throwing this out here. I've, I've been doing this since Chelmsford and I, I like it and, and building commissioners like it because it's objective, it's very bright line. And I'm not saying if you do any of this stuff, like have two non-resident employees or customers or, or, or clients coming to the house that you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, but let's let's check it out with a special permit. Whereas the other is as of right. So I'm gonna ask questions that just come to mind as someone who's been working through the pandemic. The way that this proposal is set up, overall I'm gonna say I like the idea of having it having more of it by right that is non offensive. And I think that it makes things a lot easier for people and will reduce the, hopefully reduce some of the incidental work of the ZBA for areas where it's not needed, but is continue continuing to be proposed under the current bylaw. But it, as I look at this, there are, is, number seven is the one that jumps out at me. Does not produce any customer or client trips to the location and has no non-resident employees. I think of a lot of businesses internet internet based businesses or otherwise and where people are working remotely where there may be more than more other employees it may not be a person who's working as an independent contractor whether they own the business or not but they may not have people coming to the house so it may just be a yeah. home based business and so that's where that, that's where I'm looking at this saying the language may need to yeah maybe best updated to accommodate to accommodate that and potentially to to have uh, something that said, and I'm, it may just be an issue in practice where if someone does have a meeting and there are a couple of people that come to the house, you know, once in, in a blue moon or so, it's not really a problem. It's not going to all of a sudden trigger a, a, a zoning problem because, okay, you know, we had a person stop by the house to drop off a computer or something along those lines. So I'm, I'm not, not quite sure the way to word it, but those were things that immediately jumped out, knowing that even many of us on the call will work from home from time to time and may not fall under the existing by right professions. Yeah, that includes me. So I, I think that the- Oh, the, you're an attorney. We, so you're, well, you're, but, you're giving- but I, think, I think what the pandemic has taught us is that, um, is that, Nobody would ever know you're doing this. <laughs> um, but many people need to be officially a home occupation or a home business for tax purposes. So they would they would go to the business, uh, the, uh, the town clerk's office or the building commissioner's office and say, I want to do this out of my house. I can do it as of right. They'd get a DBA certificate and now they would have status with the IRS that would allow them to deduct whatever they're going to deduct. D depending upon their business, their, their style of business, yes, that, that could certainly be flagged that there is a business that is running out of that property. Right. I mean, for me, it, uh, I don't I don't care. I'm, I'm just, nobody comes to my house except when I forget something at the office, my associate brings it over here and it's a mile and a quarter away. I could go get it myself. But I don't ever have a customer or a client come to the house. And so for me, it's, it's irrelevant. Um, whether I'm recognized as a home occupation or not here, but I'm here four out of five days for the most part. So do you have, if, if you can potentially yeah, can... Think, think about some language that would, ex that would make those types of uses by right, I think that would be yeah. helpful and useful. Others thoughts on, on that? 
as we've all survived the pandemic, I know most of us are professionals that have worked remotely at least for some time during the pandemic. Dan, I have a quick question. Should we add something for like home deliveries to keep that at bay so people don't have trucks or, you know, I mean, I, I understand like Amazon and UPS might be delivering daily. We really can't put anything on that, but for home businesses that might have a, a, a lot of deliveries, is that something that we want to add into that? Mark, um, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, two thoughts. One is that the normal language you would use, and you, you saw it a lot in examples other than the Chelmsford example, is that the traffic generated by the home occupation shall not um, be substantially greater than that associated with normal household use. But that was that sentence evolved well before the pandemic when, you know, when my kids come home, I'm getting five Amazon trucks a day showing up here. Yeah, it ain't it ain't me. It's my daughter who who have come home periodically after, during and after the pandemic. Yeah, no, I know because I mean that like I was thinking the same thing with the pandemic. People are getting Amazon boxes all day long, but well, that's why I spend the other half of my time permitting logistic facilities. I think that clause that talks about unnecessary traffic or not unnecessary, but unusual traffic, hopefully yeah. should cover that, Joe. Yeah, no, I, I missed that one, but um, I didn't know if, if that meant more on clients coming in and out and and then not with 18 wheels coming down the street. So I guess you could use that. I, I guess it counter applies. Well, I guess my basic question is, do you want to stick with what you have or do you want to toy with what I've shown you? I think the more subjective we can get is probably better because objectivity leads to folks not knowing what it means and too much wiggle room. But I think, I think it's the other way. I mean, uh, objectivity not... would be a bright standard. Okay. You, got, yeah. you, got, you, you, you can't have an employee. That's a bright standard. Or you can have an employee, but you need a special permit. That's true. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a rough couple of weeks in my job. Anyone in student affairs post October 7th is having a difficult time. So I apologize for not being on my game. No problem. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. So uh, others thoughts? to work with the existing language or to work on new language? Well, I, I did have a question, Dan. Sure. Um, currently, home occupations is in section 190-18. And in looking at it, that hasn't been touched since the zoning bylaws were adopted in 1988. And then they were codified in the late 90s, but the language hasn't been changed in here. So for instance, the 25% figure that's in there, do we know that that's what the Zoning Board of Appeals wants to keep since a lot of this stuff is dealt by the Board of Appeals? Have we consulted with them to see whether they have any suggested changes or modifications to the current language in 190-18? So I haven't heard anything official from the, the ZBA. Joe, do you know if this has come up? I'm thinking about that. I've been on four years now. I don't remember in the last four years dealing with this at all. You know, I can't remember. I know that yeah. I've seen I've I've seen home occupations come up. You know, just continue. You know, basically continuation of findings that it, yes, it's a, it's a valid home occupation. I see those postings pretty regularly. I haven't seen anything that makes them contentious. Nothing that's coming in front of our board. I don't. I don't remember anything. Any home occupation. Yeah, you're you're a little bit big to be in the conflict zone. The, the typical conflict zone is a landscaper or a a uh, contractor who thinks that they're a home occupation, but they're not. And so they've got everything from the troops mustering at six forty-five in the morning to stuff stored on the residential premises to truck loading at quarter to seven. You know, that's that's where it's still a bother. 
and we've had we've had those those types of situations yeah. come up. I don't think that those have come up at before the ZBA that I'm aware of as to a declaration that that's a home based business. And so my personal feeling is I I like the additional subjectivity to make it clear that there is more occupations that's from expressly permitted by right and the idea of, of people working from home as long as it, it's not detrimental to the neighborhood is permitted it, as we're increasing the density of the town with more types of condos apartments and other types of non-single family structures i think this is an area that's going to continue to become more important and to have it where the subjectivity is there but based on a pretty straightforward standard, I think will become very helpful. All right, well then I'm gonna take that as a uh, suggestion that I tweak the language in my version. For example, in number seven, I would put does not produce any customer or client trips to the location and has no non-resident employees coming to the location. I take Dan's point well. That would solve that problem, and I'll 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 play around with it a little bit and see what you think in the next draft. Okay, and and I'm not sure if if it should be subjective to to your point of you know your assistant dropping things off. Non, you know, uh, what comes to mind is something that might say on a regular, uh, you know, on yeah. a regular uh, or recurring basis, something so that the occasional visit is not does not create a problem because this is the type of language that could be weaponized for neighbor I, against neighbor that and, and I, that, that's where that's why i'm just trying to make sure there's a little bit of leeway there and i agree with that that was going to be my recommendation too is to have the, some language of like regular does not produce any regular customer or client trips okay i agree Other thoughts on this? Mr. McGrail. I just had a couple uh, comments. I thought Mr. Pride's comment was good. I'd be careful with this a little bit on, on deliveries. Um, yeah. And impact of, uh, you know, because pe people, you know, the, the thing, I think if you're thinking that people are going to do internet sales, I think you might want to clarify number four because it says no regular sale of wares or goods shall be conducted on the premises. I think that's intended to mean that you're not going to have people yeah. coming to the house to buy things, but I could argue that that means you can't do internet sales because it's sales. Okay. That's a good point. Premises. Thank you. And, and, and I would just be really cautious on, on, because if somebody's running a business and they're doing internet sales and they start getting a hot product, as Joe said, you can end up with a bunch of trucks and, you know, pickups multiple times a day. That's what happened out in Hadley, if I remember the case correctly. So there might be something you want to put in on that that you know limits the number of uh, delivery trucks that would go to the house a day in relation to the business or something like that. Okay. But besides that, I, I agree with Mark. I think it's a good concept that clarifies things and it it pre presents opportunity and gets rid of confusion. Yeah, I I don't, you know, I probably have done this in over over 50 places, I'm sure. And it's not like I'm getting phone calls that this is a problem. So And I know the building commissioners like it. Okay. Next section is by special permit. What it comes to mind is if there's a special permit being sure. solicited, should there be a requirement in here for notice to abutters within well, some it's a, area? I, I, I think this, what I my usual default, Dan, is to let statute speak for itself. So the special permit section will be in the uh, administrative provisions, which will be section 10. There'll be a section on special permits, and it'll basically say that special permits are to be uh, processed in accordance with chapter 48 section 11. everybody knows how to go on mass general laws these days
And and for those who don't, um, I usually advise the building department to have those applications or planning staff or ZBA staff to have those applications, you know, just give them the lay of the land. So you, here's your application. You you got to send, I don't, every town handles it differently. So are you, in, in many towns, the assessor's list is generated by the staff or in other towns it's generated by the applicant. But in any event, the mailing is supposed to be done by the board because it's the board's hearing. Although I do know towns that still require the applicant to do the mailing, which has not been accepted by the courts since the 1930s, but they're still doing it that way. So I, I you know, it's, it's chapter 48, section 11, just, just get it done. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Just wanna make sure that if someone is seeking a special permit for something that's outside of the by right, that there are notices because obviously oh, it's yeah. not it, it's not a minor issue. No, and here I think this is really important that the neighbors get noticed because it's the neighbors, the very direct neighbors that are going to be bothered. So, if at all. Any other thoughts? Going once, going twice. Moving on to the next section, 8.1, multifamily dwellings and mixed use. Okay. So I don't think I changed a lot of this. I'm just going to, can you just scan it for me so I can see it more? Anytime you see three asterisks, asterisks and your number, still there it's just a placeholder for me to go back when i have the final version and to put in the cross reference so that it's correct things are going to move around so i'm just doing that as a placeholder i don't think i changed any of this from what i see so far I mean, I gave it some captions, obviously. No. So this is a, um, a an, an inclusionary provision. Essentially what you're doing here is saying that mixed multifamily and mixed use development is going to be allowed um, in appropriate locations as shown in the table of use regulations. And if you're doing these things in combination with other uses, that's permissible as well. Really didn't change uh, any, any of it just other than add captions where I thought that it could use that. So, so, so will this, the first thing that comes to mind is based upon the discussions that I've heard over the last few weeks, will this also be subject to the MBTA communities with this, this piece be inclusive of the definitions for that? The density will have to be, what are they talking about still? 15 units an acre, right? As that's, a separate, that's a separate bylaw. They did. It's a total different bylaw, Mr. Chia, that that committee's working on. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a separate bylaw. It hasn't been approved yet. I'm just wondering if, if that's something that would be in, because it would, there are a lot of parallels to this bylaw. And there really, there really aren't, because this one is, this one is more geared towards the business and industrial districts, whereas that is geared towards overlay districts outside of a lot of those areas. And I've been following that pretty closely. Yeah, the rule of thumb on MBTA is that um, if you got an existing bylaw or for example, a 40R bylaw, that it could count for MBTA, but most towns are going about the business of MBTA by drafting new bylaws for right. areas that they're deeming appropriate for multifamily housing down the road. Right. And and, and, and part of this is that, into it, but yeah, I was gonna say part of this is there is 
so there there is some overlay overlap in some of the, the language, such as anything that's around a commuter rail station, half, roughly half a mile. Yeah, they they're calling um, it's just an eligible location under MBTA, uh, but it's understood what that means, and it's pretty much the same as 40R, which is the whole notion of a half a mile to a transit node. So your your inclusionary stuff is fine in that it is 18% uh, of the total number of dwelling units. It's, you know, it's, it's I, don't, I don't know that that will discourage or encourage anybody. It's on the high end. All right. But so I, are, have you do, ever had anybody take advantage of this before? Mr. McGrail, do you know the answer to that? Oh yeah, this is this is like this is where Foundry Street um yeah, a lot of redevelopment in in old industrial districts marked in on the business corridor right near the railroad. Good. Uh Tono's restaurant, that building was done by this. Yeah, when I read it and renumbered it and gave it captions, I didn't see anything in here that I thought was legal or illegal. I'm sorry, illegal. Um, this was put in by the town plan of uh, Mr. Revis back in 2015, I think. Yeah, it 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 it, it definitely incorporates. The, the thing I worry about the most in a provision like this is the uh, provision in Chapter 48, Section 9, which says that you can increase density or intensity of use uh, where the applicant provides one of the uh, goodies would be affordable housing, but you have to give a specific formula that for so much housing, they get so much of a density increase. And I, I don't see anything in here that violates the spirit of that. I think it's fine. So given that it's, in my opinion, not, you know, trailing behind it, any legal problems. I just renumbered it. The chair, there's one housekeeping okay. item on the affordable component. If you could find that, I could point that out that I think it should be updated. Um, all right, there. Uh, it says approved by the Department of Housing and Community Development or oh, successor yeah. agency. So now I think there is a successor agency. I forget yeah, what, success, it's what is it now, Mark? Economic something? Or... Executive Office exec of, of um, Housing and, com and Community mm -hmm. Living. Housing and Livable Communities. And livable Communities, right. Thank you. So I, I just would suggest that that maybe should change. Okay. Does that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I have it up on my screen in the in my version here, so let me just look for that. In a couple spots, Mark, it's even in the next paragraph. Then I might want to just do a word search. Yeah, it's it's in the paragraph above that too. It's in, yeah. it's yeah. right. Is it top of page four? Yeah. And then again in eight one ten. Got it. Any other questions on this section? Dan, yeah, can you scroll up to 8.1.8 .8 right there, that first line? I think that's seven supposed to be an eight too, right? Is it about, right, the intent of this subsection Yep. Yeah, I've, I've changed it already. That's why I, okay. I'm just arbitrarily assigning numbers and then I forget. When I go yeah, back and look at them, I, I sometimes do that. So That's the only thing I could do. Oh, okay.
one of the the issues that I know comes up on a fairly regular basis before ZBA in discussion is about parking regulations and the ability to it to allow projects to proceed if they don't meet the minimum parking regulations per the bylaw itself. And is this permitting permitting the ZBA to reduce the parking? The yeah, parking you'll, you, well, you'll see in the parking and loading provisions, which I'm going to email you tomorrow because they're all ready to go, that I always add a provision at the end that says relief by special permit. And it basically says that if you don't like something in the parking and loading requirements, you can ask the special permit granting authority for um, what you what you would prefer instead, as long as you can show the SPGA that it isn't detrimental to the public health and safety. Because too often we end up with a sea of asphalt that's planned specifically for December 10th, the busiest shopping day of the year. And it's just, you know, an endless eyesore the rest of the days. Or uh, it, it could even extend to things like number of compact spaces or, you know, really anything in the parking, including landscaping, would be fair game for relief. You got to ask, but and asking doesn't mean you're going to get it, but you, you can ask. Okay. I, I just know that this question is definitely going to come up at town meeting because in this town, if it's parking, chances are it's going to come up or related to parking, it's going to come up at town meeting and there's going to be debate on it. Just because if there's one thing this town loves to debate, it's parking. Okay. Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? It's a, uh, according to some people, it's the biggest problem that's ever happened. According to others, it's not a problem anywhere. So it, it's just an issue. At least we have it on the record that yes, relief can be granted and it will probably want to review that section as to what the requirements are to, what the guidelines are to, for the ZBA to grant relief. So that there is the ability to get it granted when necessary and for there to be reasons when it should not be granted. And that, that should be clarified there. So the ZBA has the direction that's needed. Questions, thoughts? Moving right along, the last section for this evening is section 8.2 related to this conversion to apartments as single units and to multi units. So these were sort of sprinkled out around the, the, the bylaw. Um, and I don't think, let me just look at your use table. I know they were sort of separate and apart from the other residential uses in the use table. Yeah, so if you go in the use table, you'll see in the first page, you get through all this uh, residential stuff and then it turns to religious purposes, agriculture, railroads. And then on the top of the second page of the use table, about seven or eight lines down, conversion of a pre-1935 dwelling to a two-family use on a lot of 12,000. And right after that, conversion of a dwelling to a three or four family use on a lot of at least 13,000 square feet. And that's two of those. And then there's another one. It's just in the, those are the districts that it allows it in. And th so those are the two. It's those are the two, and they're separate and apart from the residential uses, but they're really residential uses, right? 
So those are going to go in the residential section of the table of uses. And these are the rules that accompany these entries in the table. And I didn't change it. They're just what they what they are. The conversion rules are in a separate section, which is 32G, 19032G. And There's one for each. So the single family and the three or four dwelling, um, for example, the three or four, if you look, I, mine is page 23 of 65, but it's, it's 190, 32, in the old bylaw. This is the old bylaw that I believe you're referring to. Yeah, in the old bylaw. So G, uh, 19032G is the two conversions, single family and a single family to residence district so it's limited to the residence district and that's only to two units and then a single or two family can be converted to three or four but only in the gr and the business districts and those are that's exactly what i i just took those regulations that are uh in the in the text of the bylaw and put it there and then i'm going to add you know, conversion of a two two of a single unit to a two unit dwelling in the and in, in the single residence district column, it'll say um, special permit BA. And so this would be the the requirement to have a legal two family as opposed to right. one that's been been perhaps been informally converted. Right. Exactly. And, the, and, and if you want a three or four, same deal. I don't but know how the, many three or three or four informal units we have, but I know that two families uh, that are informal is something that it, that does occur throughout the town. In some cases, it, it was set up as an in-law style apartment, and then you know, the people who constructed it that way no longer have that need, or it's been sold and then rented out and so mm -hmm. forth yep which does think... bring up it bring up an issue related to the accessory uses if someone has a unit along those lines that may or may not be a considered to be a separate dwelling is there anything that needs to be or should be in here that would affect its use for short-term rental airbnb or something along those lines do you have a short-term rental bylaw at the moment we do not yeah, well, you'd have to do that. I can show you a couple of them from other towns if you'd like to see them. I don't know if anybody's working on that now. I'm not aware that anyone's working on it. In it, it, it's in the last time we had a discussion on it, we basically made a decision that, or the sentiment was to not not take up the issue where it does not seem to be a current problem. But if, if it's something that you think should be built into either the uses or have the framework built in, should it be added later, now seems to be the time to potentially put that framework in, even if we don't put the, the, the actual uh, other details around it, whether it would be permitted, not permitted, and so forth. I, I tend to think of this more from the perspective of um, the um, accessory apartments. I wouldn't want anyone to confuse an accessory apartment as a second dwelling unit in a conversion. I, I think that the dwelling units in the conversion are both principal and an accessory apartment is, as it says, a accessory. So I think there's a clarification that probably should be made there. 
In other words, well, I, I have to go back and look at your accessory apartment bylaw, but I'm trying to remember if there's a size limitation. And I also probably should ask you whether or not well, let me do one thing at a time. Twenty-five percent, Mark. It's twenty-five percent of the habitable dwelling limit size. Is there a max size, though? Yeah, uh, maximum. No, minimum size. Three hundred square. It has to be at least three hundred square feet. No maximum. No, 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 no. Just a twenty-five percent of the total habitable area of the house is the max size. Okay. So lots of times, for example, the governor's bill on accessory apartments limits accessory apartments to i believe it's i think it's either eight or nine hundred square feet or 50 percent of the principal structure whichever is less um and so in that kind of a case if i was converting something in an existing two family into two units um or an existing single family into two units i could i could go beyond uh, 800 square feet or 900 square feet they could each be 1250 square feet and but they'd both be principal units if you will on the other hand if i wanted to do an accessory i'd have to stick with the size limit and that that brings up the question do you want to see, you have an old accessory apartment bylaw do you want to see a governor baker two-year-old accessory dwelling unit bylaw because you can now do those Yours, for example, I believe only allows the units to be constructed in the principal dwelling. And under the governor's legislation, it could be done in an, in an outbuilding, like a, you know, a carriage house or a garage. I guess my question is, what kind of luck have you had with accessory apartments? So I've pulled up this 190.22 accessory use section F is where it, where this is in the current bylaw. Yeah, not exceed 25% of the habitable area of the dwelling in which it's located. I'm not aware that, that accessory apartments has been much of an area of discussion in, in at least in the last, I'm thinking ten to fifteen years, I'm I'm not I I can't recall any major public discussion on it. Well, I was kind of surprised to see it in the governor's housing bill because it's certainly the lowest common denominator for getting lots of affordable housing. I mean, you, you much better bang for your buck to do other things than accessory dwelling units. Other thoughts, Eric, has this been, been an issue that you can recall? I, I'm asking because you have the best long memory of the group, I think. Well, I can name, uh, I can report that uh, there was an apartment put above a garage and a uh, uh, cousin was involved, our cousin's children, but this was decades ago. It's no longer in the family. Um, I don't as a child or not young adult, I recall no discussion about this which took place. Okay. Uh, so one, oh, well. So, so, so one thing that does come that does come up is, and I don't think this is in the in the language they proposed to Tony Bobrowski, is this section four at the bottom, particularly that the special permit should be issued on a year-to-year -year basis. So that the special, the, the permit for an accessory use would effectively disappear if it was to be stopped being used as, as an apartment. Is yeah, the way that I'm reading that. Well, you don't make it, um, maybe you're not owner occupancy required you're not requiring a family member to live in there are you yes it's required should there be a change in ownership a change in the residence of the owner or the death or removal of the surviving parent or family member occupying the accessory apartment so that's really a, that's that's old school i mean 
today, you would have to certify that either the, you'd have to certify owner occupancy, but the owner would need to certify only that he or she occupies one of the two units, either the principal or the accessory. And you can see how that would benefit somebody aging in place because they get a lot more rent for the house than they would for the accessory apartment. And if that's all they need is an accessory apartment, they could move into that. And it doesn't matter who lives in the other unit. It, it could be, you know, anybody. Yeah, but aren't we talking about two different things right now? We were just talking about one and two family. Now we're talking about next, like an indoor apartment. Aren't those two different? Yeah, you're right. I mean, we're saying we, I, I I just wanted to make the I, I wanted to make the statement that I don't think that the um, if we're if we're doing conversions of, of of buildings into two units, then each of those two units is principal. Not yeah, as, and yeah. right. That that's all I'm trying to say, basically. But okay. I but then we then we spilled over to talk about accessory apartments, and you've got a pretty old school model here. So maybe I should show you when we talk about this next time, Dan. If you put if you put the file called accessory uses that I'm going to send you um, on the agenda, then I can send you a governor's ADU accessory dwelling unit bylaw. I just did one in uh, Medford. Okay, that would that would be helpful for us to review and and yeah. look at. Yep. I, I think you should think long and hard about whether or not the accessory apartment ought to be an in-law apartment, as it's often called, right? It doesn't have to be. So it doesn't and, and, need and to I, be. And, and I think that's something the and, and I request that all of the members of the committee to think about and talk talk with others about what should the what should the style of accessory apartments be? Because we, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is we know we do have a need for additional housing in the town, in the area. And this may or may not be an appropriate use. I'm not advocating one way or the other, but asking people to get opinions as to, is that something that could potentially be a source of additional housing? And that may make sense without increasing the the significant physical density of the buildings that we have. So that, that's where, where I'm looking at this saying, it might be a really good use of the of a zoning update to help with some of the, the various pieces that we're trying to do in the town to help the townspeople. Any questions, anything else, anything that anyone would like to bring up? Yeah, I'd just like to, if I could, Mr. Chair, just to mention sure. that that's a real substantive change of the bylaw. That's that's a big change. So what just you, so aware, what is because, right? Well, the, to, to, to change the accessory use to not limit it to family members. Now yeah. you're basically saying you can create a two family house with no limitation by special permit in any any neighborhood. Well, the size oh, limit, though, is the size. There's a size limit, limit but I, I, I'm just, I, I, I just, it's a pretty big change. I mean, yeah. if it's no, by no special permit, or if it's by special permit, it would be great for my business because uh, I get, <laughs> I get so many calls a week from people that want to put a two family in, and I tell them they can't. Um, but and I think, the, I, but I think the experience, and you can talk about your cus your clients with this. Um, I think the experience on accessory dwelling units, given the low size limitation of 800, 900 square feet, to tear your house apart and invest all that money and then to get the rent associated with 800 square feet, you know, that's a 20 year proposition. You're not going to you're not going to make a windfall next year. <laughs> and yeah. most, oh, and they're and always we, for rent. They're we, not for sale. We've got yeah. a real desirable community here. And. I'm just telling you the calls I get all the time. I get calls all the time that, that yeah. people, and I tell them, you, you can't do it unless you have a family member. And they say, okay, thanks, sorry. I, you know, and, yeah. and these aren't, you know, people find fine ways. You know, I'm just it's telling a, you. They'll, they'll right. say, uh, and I'm talking myself out of business, but I'm saying, you know, it, just for your committee to contemplate this, it's a big change from what we do now. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, people will say, well, I'm going to live there. And, and you know, they, they all, there's ways to get around things. And I would just be careful with that. That's all. Well, there's many sad tales where, yeah, you know, grandma, grandma dies and there's moves a, moves a friend in and they have to get, they get thrown out. But imagine the poor building inspector telling an 80 year old woman that she has to move because she's not related. We we had a situation similar to that in in town, yeah. so it, it, and so the, I'm, not the, 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 either, I'm not advocating right. either way. I just wanted to point out that it's yeah, a you're right. big change, and it's you know it's 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 really beyond a recodification. It's a major change in the bylaw. And and to your point, you're. I think you're correct that this would be a substantive policy change. But it's also within the purview of the committee to propose it. I think that if there is a change that is advocated for, it should be highlighted in presentation and in discussion. But I don't think the fact that it's a change that it's a policy change like that, if it one is advocated, should preclude it from potentially being built into a recodification either, because that is part of part of our job is to specifically improve the bylaws and adjust them to meet the to meet the requirements of what we currently have that's part of why this process goes on every five years and you know some parts of the bylaws get more focused than others when this is, has occurred so but your point i think is well taken that that would be really a, a substantive policy change and it would be up to town meeting to obviously make a final decision on that. And if someone you know disagreed with the committee one way or the other, they could always propose a an amendment on it at the at the town meeting itself. But yeah, I think also, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a really good point to bring up and for us to discuss in more depth as we get into the accessory uses. Well, I'll probably vote for it. But I just want to point out it's a big change. That's all. Um, so, and, I, and and any change like that is you know going to require uh, planning board public hearings because you're dealing with substantive changes to the bylaws, not just renumbering and recodification. Oh, even the renumbering requires that. So yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, I um I know I'm coming back to meet with you again on the twentieth. Why don't Why don't you um pick a few more of these things. Like I said, there's a grand total of 25. So if we can knock off half a dozen, the ones that are jumping out at me that we should talk about next time are the accessory use section, which I just finished today. So I'll be sure to send you the read numbered one. Um, and then you pick, they're all pretty big. Trailers is easy. That's two minutes of discussion. Um, and Do you have a movie just, trailer on that? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then the other ones are pretty long. It's mixed use development, open space development, um, munis probably municipal business overlay district. That, that's an easy <clears> one. <throat> uh, the creative overlay district, the attached dwelling unit overlay district. These are pretty big ones. So I didn't change much, but um, but they tend to be five four or five pages so so we'll, we'll once i get them i'll take a take a look try to keep the amount of, of material conducive to as with this meeting my goal is to get it somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes to just to be respectful of everyone's time yeah. and but the accessory uses will have there and trailers just because we can and then we'll pick some some of the others yeah. to try to try and incorporate as well that's good so, with that our next meeting is scheduled for two weeks from today monday november 20th before everyone gets to eat a whole lot of turkey before that happens the set we will get to convene the saturday beforehand november 18th is town meeting from and looking at the warrant if you haven't taken a look at it highly recommend it it's a short a short town meeting I don't anticipate that it's going to take very long just based upon what's included in it. I think there's something on the order of around nine articles. And you know, it just doesn't seem to be particularly controversial, but it, 
it is the, there's one the last article may generate some discussion on energy stretch code change, changing the way that the uh, energy code is, is implemented in the town but other otherwise if you're not able to be at the meeting itself please drop me a note just stating that you're unable to be there and put in a reason that way I I'm able to meet the the requirement of knowing why why members are not present because we are all required to be at the town meetings unless we have a valid reason and the chair so it so declares I'll declare any reason that you give the that can be deemed valid I'll deem it as valid as a matter of course so town meeting Saturday November 18th then we've got our meeting November 20th and then a couple of days after that, we've got the holiday of Thanksgiving on November 23rd, followed by the uniquely American holiday on Friday, November 24th, called Black Friday, where everyone gets to shop. Please keep in mind, a lot of the shopping this year has changed. And I'm mentioning that just to, in deference to the many small businesses that we have in town. A lot of, of organizations, including places around town, have started their Black Friday sales and so forth. They've started them this week. So it's been been an unusual uh, sales cycle. A lot of them are starting on Wednesday of this week. November 8th seems to be the unofficial start to the Black Friday season where people are doing a lot of the hol holiday sales, shopping, things along those lines. And businesses, certain, local businesses in particular, certainly appreciate any patronage that you can give to them. And of course, the, they all have to go through zoning and so forth. So they become a subject of, of this. And if you do go to into shops and stores, you now have topics to talk about over the next couple of weeks. You can talk with you know, both the shopkeepers and fellow shoppers about accessory dwelling units. I'm sure there's nothing that you'd rather talk oh. about. Perfect. Or of course you could talk you can talk with, you know, about attorney Bobrowski and you know need, needing to have that or attorney McGrail services as may be appropriate. Any any other topics that people would like to bring up? Thank you all. Okay, with that, it is time for the most fun vote of the evening. Do we have a motion to adjourn? See you in two weeks. Okay, Mr. Pride, make the motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? A second. Catherine is, is seconding the motion. So with that, we will take the, the voting in the order in which it appears on my screen. Eric. That's an I, Tim. Yes. Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Lucy. Yes. Anne. Yes. Catherine. Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. So with that, at 824, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you all in two weeks. Appreciate all of your time. And if you've got any questions or anything, please let me know that I am trying to set up just as an informational piece, a um, meeting of the smaller board sometime in between these two meetings. So we may have additional feedback as well on behalf of planning board and, and ZBA that may become relevant in, in particular for the accessory uses. So just, just want to mention that it's not required, but it's something that I'm, I'm working on. So thank you everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.